Welcome to the Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Over the last two months, we have had five unique and extraordinary dialogues with thought leaders in energy that covered a wide range of topic from impacts of COVID-19 to energy access and climate change. These videos uh, are available at gef.stanford.edu. Today, we have a very special guest. Don Evans served as a 34th U.S. Secretary of Commerce between 2001 and 2005. A graduate of University of Texas Austin in mechanical engineering, Secretary Evans has a long history in the energy industry, starting off in 1975 working in oil rigs for Tom Brown Inc. and then becoming its CEO in 1985, where he served for 15 years before joining the Bush administration. He also served as the chairman of Energy Futures Holdings Company, formerly TXU Energy, from 2007 to 2018, and currently serves as chairman of the Permian Strategic Partnership. Sally? Having this dialogue with him will be Tom Stevenson, who is a member of the Advisory Council of the Precord Institute for Energy at Stanford University, a former ambassador to Portugal, Tom has been part of Sequoia Capital since 1998. He started the Schultz Stevenson Task Force on Energy Policy at the Hoover Institution, where he also serves as the chair of the Board of Overseers. After the Stevens, uh, Evan Stevenson dialogue, we will have two Stanford students asking questions. And finally, Arun and I will return to manage the questions from all of you in the audience. Uh, but to set the stage, like always, we have a couple of quizzes for you. Uh, so here's the first one. So the question is, which country is the largest producer of petroleum and natural gas in the world? Okay, well, why don't we wrap that one up? Okay, well, you guys are just way too smart. Okay, yes, it's uh, the, uh, the United States is the uh, largest producer. And according to the Energy Information Agency, um, as of 2019, the U.S. is the largest producer, as you've gotten right, uh, at 60 quadrillion BTUs, or 60 quads. Uh, and of that, 29 is oil and 31 is gas. Uh, Russia is second at 50 quads, uh, split equally between oil and gas. And Saudi Arabia is third at 30 quads, which is primarily oil. Okay, so let's go to quiz number two, and we'll look at the consumption side. So question, which country is the largest consumer of oil in the world? And you've got a choice of four there. Okay, uh, yes, right again. Uh, wonderful to see how knowledgeable our audience is today. Uh, and the U.S. leads by consuming about 19.96 uh, uh, million barrels a day. Uh, China at 13, India at 4, and uh, Japan at uh, 3.9. So, uh, so with that, uh, let's turn this over to you, Tom. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, a great pleasure for me to welcome my longtime friend, uh, Don Evans, and thank him for joining us this morning. This will be a really fun and uh, interesting discussion. Uh, Don and I have known each other for about 20 years, going back to uh, the beginnings of the Bush administration. Don and, and uh, President Bush have uh, been wonderful friends for many, many years in Midland, Texas, and uh, uh, both uh, grew up in the oil and gas business. Uh, Don was Secretary of Commerce, but in many respects, he performed a lot of the roles that uh, Secretary of Energy, he was, uh, uh, he brought in Sam Bodman, uh, who had been his Deputy of Commerce to be the Secretary of Energy, uh, Sam preceded Steve Chu and uh, Ernie Meniz, both of whom are affiliated with us and have been on uh, this program. So um, let me uh, suggest, I think what Don can do particularly well is to give us some background and perspective on what the oil and gas industry looked like 20 years ago. There's been an enormous amount of change. Don's been right in the middle of that. Uh, a lot of involvement with Russia and China, uh, his affiliation and uh, long friendship and uh, partnership with Sam. So uh, Don, why don't we start by talking, a little, just giving you the opportunity to give us a little bit of stage setting on the, uh, from a background and perspective standpoint on the oil and gas business. Tom, thank you. Uh, what an honor to be a part of the 
Stanford Global Energy Dialogue and uh, look at those you've already had on this program. I'm, I'm be here and Tom, thank you for your longtime friendship and you know, I can't get close to Stanford without talking about uh, all of our dear friends, George Schultz and all he did in my career and all he's done in my life and the wisdom he provided me while I was in a government and, and beyond quite frankly. So, so an honor to be here. I'm gonna start out with, uh, I think the punchline or maybe it's not the punchline necessarily, but it was certainly one of the most powerful defining moments of my time in government. And that was being my first meeting with Vladimir Putin and on November, uh, well, let me go back to September 11th first. 9-11, Vladimir Putin was the first world leader to call the president. He called President Bush that day and told the president, look, I just want you to know whatever you need by way of support or resources or manpower or whatever, I'm with you. We're here for you. We're, we're, we've got your back. We're, and so that was the first call. President Bush returned that kind gesture to him by inviting him to Crawford in early November. I happened to be there. I was one of a party of about 25. Uh, Vladimir Putin, Putin after dinner, at dinner, stood up and made a powerful toast to the president. And then we walked outside and it was a November evening, kind of cool. Uh, I happened to walk out alongside President Putin. We went by a fireplace, a fire pit that was close by and started chatting. And it was, started chatting about oil and gas and, and uh, he knew I was in the oil and gas industry and so he wanted to know my thoughts. And, and then he asked me a question. He said, uh, Mr. Secretary, how has America accomplished so much in only 200 years? And so that was, you know, 200 years, that question seemed like maybe a long time when you think about it, not so long. I mean, by, you know, uh, the time we were born, France had already had 16 King Louis and China had been around for thousands of years, but I told, I told President Putin as I thought about it for a moment, I said, listen, I, I think our success is, is first of all our freedoms that are grounded in our constitution. I think they're a big part of it. I think another big part of it is our democratic capitalistic system, our free enterprise system that encourages competition, that encourages risk taking, that in, uh, encourages uh, ingenuity and the entrepreneurial spirit that uh, continues to thrive in this great country. And then I told him, I said, you know, in America, the people of America wake up every morning trying to do the right thing. People in America are basically good, decent, honest people. And if you're not, people are not good, basic, honest people, then they, it just won't work. And so we, we talked along for a while longer, but over the next several years, I had a chance to get kind of up close and, and get to know him a whole lot better. It's been a number of um, meetings with him. I remember one of the first meetings was in 2002 when the president and I and, and his president's entourage, we were over there for a arms reduction uh, tr treaty signing. And President Putin had invited us out to his dacha for that, have dinner that night. So we went out there and it was the president and president had along with him, Colin Powell and Condi Rice and myself. And, and President Putin had similar counterparties on his side. Uh, Mrs. Bush was there as well. We had a delightful evening. At one point in the evening, I turned to President Putin. I said, uh, Mr. President, you know you have a third of the natural gas reserves in the world are here in, in Russia that you control. And President Bush kind of looked at him. Vlad Vladimir, did you know that? And he, he smiled and said, well, yeah, maybe, yeah, he, he knew it. Yeah, he did, he did know it because it was uh, part of it was what put him on the world stage. Oil and gas put him on the world stage. That g gave him the power that he was really looking for in the world. And, and so as I got to know him better, I remember one discussion we had. He said, Mr. Secretary, you know, we, we have, have a lot of reserves here, a lot of oil reserves. Uh, America's the import oil, the imports are continuing to grow. It looks like they're going to continue to grow for years to come. He was saying that because he knew our oil production had been, had been in decline since 1972, basically. I told him, well, I don't think we need to do that. I mean, I look, just put your oil out there on the world market and let it track the highest price that it can. And, and that's how I think, you know, what I did encourage him, you know, you do have great resources here. You ought to use it for the good of mankind. And and, you know, if I was you, I'd probably build uh, petrochemical co complexes on top of my gas reserves and oil reserves. And, 
But those discussions continued on. And uh, he asked me at one point, he was wondering about pipeline routes because he was worried about China at the point, at that point in time. There's 11 or 12 time zones between Russia and China. And they were very concerned about China. And so there was a route coming out of Western Siberia and he didn't know if he should stop there on the close to the border of China or take it on out to the Pacific. Uh, he asked me what I thought as if I knew a whole lot about it, which I can't tell you that I did, but I gave him my thoughts anyway. But it was always strategic thinking, always how do I use this resource strategically to put me in a better position in the world, kind of like a strategic uh, weapon for him. So I, I, I gathered insight about him and how he thought in Russia. I've got, I've got great friends in Russia, German Graf, who runs Spearbank who comes to Stanford as a Mac once a year, is a great friend of mine. But in 05, when I left uh, government, I moved back to Midland, Texas, which is right in the middle of the Permian Basin. And uh, I got a call from President Putin and he asked me if I would come see him. I was sure if President calls you, once to say yes. Yeah. So I went to see him and, um, you know, he surprised me by, you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, I was wondering if you would consider being a ch chairman of Rosneft. And of course, I was flattered that he would think I could be a chairman of a Russian oil company of that size. And he was anxious to put it on the London Stock Exchange, felt like he needed a, a CEO from a former uh, public company in the West, like the company that, that I ran as a CEO. And, and so anyway, I, I was flattered by, by it, but it, it, I realized that after a few days, it really wasn't something that, that I needed to consider seriously. But so that little theme will carry throughout my remarks th th this morning about kind of him looking at his admiration for America and have you accomplished so much in only 200 years. It's quite remarkable. Tom, you, you ask about China, just real quick. I mean, my first trip to China was with, I met with Jiang Zemin. Uh, he said, thank Mr. Secretary for coming. If you want to come back as our friend, go West. What we have going on out there. I got hundreds of millions of people li living in poverty out there. So I went west, I met two blind brothers, one was nine and one was 11. I uh, stayed with them through, I've been to see them again five times. Uh, they're very much aware of my friendship with these two blind boys. When I first went to see him, see them, they lived in a little thatch hut, two dirt floors, no electricity, nothing. I, I went to the older one's wedding a couple of years ago, 2018, they had built a new home and in his home, he had a flat screen TV. And so in that amount of time, we have been a part of this country, be through our energy, been a part of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, uh, a few of them that I, of course, know per personally. Uh, OPEC is another one we'll touch on. Tom, you can't talk about OPEC without saying that what, what happened coming out of World War II, America was the largest producer in the world by far. We were producing about 6 million barrels a day and the world was about 9 million barrels a day. By 1972, about 25 years later, uh, no, no, no longer was America the number one producer in the world. In fact, we, we were importing crude, crude oil, uh, importing a substantial amount of crude oil already. And that led to, to the oil embargo uh, because of the Israeli uh, Ron Yon Kippur War. We supported Israel. Uh, they, they cut off our oil. Our price of oil went from $3 to $12 in a few years. It was $30 eight years later. We had long gasoline lines. It was used as a weapon against America. And so that kind of set our energy policy from my perspective in place for the last 45 plus years, which was stability in, in the Middle East. The importance for that oil to continue to flow into the global marketplace. Because all during those years, our production was basically declining. And uh, nobody saw any way we, we were gonna turn it around. Those in the industry or beyond. And there was a lot of things we tried, a lot of things we thought about, but, but the, the realistic economic forces should just look like we're not going to be able to overcome them. So, so you know, I, I would say that, you know, uh, I, we've seen dramatic changes in the last, you know, 20 years. I had a front row seat. Uh, I'll, I'll to talk about the time from, you know, the, the late part of the last decade to now, to now and how dramatic the changes have been and how 
uh, America has gone from a, a country of energy scarcity to energy abundance, which I think is a great untold story of our of my lifetime. I, I can tell you that. I don't. It's just an amazing story what the ingenuity, innovation, risk-taking entrepreneurship in America has done to put, put us on a stronger national security, uh, economic security, energy security uh, foothold is just amazing. Changed the whole world order in, in the last 10 or 15 years. So, let me stop there, I could, and because I know we have other ground we want to cover, but, but uh, anyway, that, that, that frames it up a little bit for us, I hope. Yeah, uh, talk a little bit about our friend uh, Sam Bodman and the uh, impact that he had uh, on our energy policy and, LA and uh, energy action. You know, I was, uh, look, th thanks for asking that one. Sam, of course, your dear friend, my dear friend, Sam was brilliant. I mean, Sam was a PhD in chemical engineering from MIT, taught at MIT with Ned Johnson. He, he built Fidelity in, in the 70s and 80s. He took over Cabot, a, a global organization. He, he was, that company was one of the first to build a, a plant in China, a carbon black plant in China in the, in the mid eighties. Uh, Sam was a, a, you know, he, he, he was the quintessential Renaissance man. And, and I knew there was one part of his life that he really hadn't experienced yet. And that was public service. So when I became secretary of commerce, I, I asked Sam, he would like to come in and serve as my deputy. And the timing could not have been better for Sam and for me. Because on, on our on our desk of 2001 was a 2001 IPCC report, and it brought a lot of attention to global ch climate change and what was occurring in the world and a lot of conversation about it. I was getting a lot, a lot of heat about it. We, what what are we going to do? Uh, I had Sam there at my side who uh, knew the issue and knew it well, uh, and so I told him to take charge. He did. Uh, we asked how much money is being spent on climate change. First number was 500 million. Then we found somebody else had 600 million. Somebody else had 300 million. By the time it was all over, finding all the different pockets of global climate change activities and cross government, it was 5.7 billion. And so Sam thought best we try and bring all of those parties together, put a structure in place, will handle the science side, energy will handle the technology side, We'll prioritize this spending, and we'll really start to to uh, get, gather the data that we need to have to make the strong policy decisions that are important to this country. One of the first things Sam did was he, he put a, a, a global uh, or organization together, brought all the countries together that would participate, and was many, many of them, to share data, starting with temperature data. And so, Sam was just a, you know, uh, for me, man, I just couldn't have uh, been, a, had a better deputy. He went on to be tre treasury and then he, energy, as you know, uh, you know, what he did there w was re remarkable. I'll talk about this some later, I'll mention it now, but then when Sam, Sam was a big believer in re research. And I know he had left a couple of re research pr programs there that uh, Secretary Chu built on and they continue to build on them. But he was really strong about wanting government to invest in basic science re research. So he brought that with, with him to the Department of Energy. And the other thing he wanted was the data of where we were energy wise at that point in time. So he charged the Energy Department and the Petroleum Council to put an energy report together, the outlaw look to 2030. So in 2007, it produced a report called Hard, Hard Truths. I would commend all of you on this call to take a look at it, but I can tell you, it was a very bleak picture in terms of energy for America in 2007. There's really not a lot of, a lot of talk in there about natural gas, quite frankly. There is some, but the prospects for it did not look particularly good. And the prospects for producing and increasing our oil production in America did not look particularly good. Now, you know, it, 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 it so happens that obviously things turned dramatically, but in, in typical Sam Bodman, uh, he wanted to know the facts. He wanted to know the data. He, he, he wanted to kind of, kind of understand this incredibly complex problem as well as he could so he could help uh, design policy for the 
country for uh, while he was working there as Secretary of Energy. That's a great lead in, Don, to what I'd like to have you talk about next, which is uh, how the oil and gas industry has developed in the last decade. You've been right in the middle of that, sitting in the in Midland, Texas, in the Permian Basin, the strategic partners uh, group that you're chairing today to look at it. But talk to us a little bit of how all that evolved, how we went from the oil and gas industry that you described in the early 2000s to one where we were the world leaders uh, in the development of uh, hydraulic fracturing technology and uh, uh, horizontal drilling and the, the, the tremendous impact that that has had on our ability, particularly to develop the natural gas industry that's had so many positive impacts. Yeah, thanks for that question, Tom. Look, I've had a front row seat and uh, in, in what, what has happened. And I'm going to begin with uh, me being asked to be chairman of Energy Future Holdings. Aaron mentioned that earlier that I was a chairman. I became chairman in, in 2007, which is the same year that the, that the book came out, Hard Truths. And uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, KKR, and TPG bought <laughs> energy then for $48 billion. And it was a natural gas play. Natural gas prices were seven dollars an MCF. Uh, they they had increased dramatically in the pre previous couple of years. Uh, in fact, the matter is the political hot topic at the time were was growing utility prices across America. Uh, as I took on the role at, at Energy Future Holdings, I was certainly getting a tremendous amount of heat in terms of higher utility prices in the state of Texas. So, and t t taking on that role, and, and what they did, they were, you know, thought they were smart. Look, this goes through cycles. Industry does, oil and gas. So we're, we're going to hedge our bets for, for five years. We're going to hedge gas prices for five years. But what was happening during that time was that there was a, a wildcat in spirit in, in uh, t Texas that you just went, there was no way you, you were going to ever put that spirit out. And George Mitchell was somebody that was just kept... Uh, trying different ways to, to extract more gas from rocks in what's called the Barnett Shale Play at Fort Worth and Dallas. And he worked on it for years. And finally, in the mid part of that decade, he started to have some success. And so he had success and industry thought, well, that's interesting. And th these were ho horizontally drilled frack wells. Uh, the next thing you knew, that idea went, went over to Haynesville, which was kind of North Louisiana and East Texas. Wow, it works over here. And, and then the next thing you knew, it went to Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, the big Marcellus play. And, and that's a total game changer for, for America and the world. It's just, it, it's breathtaking the reserves that, that are up there. Uh, we, we produce what, 2% of them in, in place, you know, one and a half percent of them. I mean, the gas reserves in the Marcellus are just absolutely remarkable. And I would also say that the gas reserves in the Permian Basin, even though it's considered an oil basin, are also remarkable. But in those early days, the industry was, was uh, developing this new technology. Industry didn't believe this could work in, in oil reservoirs. They thought the, the oil was just too viscous, uh, too thick, wouldn't move uh, with this kind of treatment, with this kind of frack technology. And, and they really didn't give, give it a lot of hope. But, but but the first play that looked like it might work well, was the Bakken. That was early on, probably in the, you know, 2009 or 10, something like that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the Eagleford play in, in the state of Texas looked like, well, it's got some promise. And then in, in probably 2013 or 14 is when uh, the, that technology really came to the Permian Basin. Uh, it has led to uh, the defining one of the largest reserves in the world. Uh, I now call the per Permian Basin the largest secure supply of energy in the world. Uh, keyword energy, because we have more windmills say, out here than any other state in, in the country. Uh, we have solar farms that are being built out. But, but the oil play just started developing here in the Permian in such a big and powerful way that it caught the attention of all the oil and gas companies, including, of course, the, the, the big four, the big five, Exxon and Chevron and Conoco and BP, Shell and the like. 
And, and they said, we, we, we've got a lot to do here. Uh, and we don't know hey, how we're going to deliver it all, how we're going to execute our plans. They gave their plans to McKinsey. McKinsey came out with a report and said, look, if, if you execute your plans by the middle of this decade we're in right now, the Permian Basin would be the third or fourth largest producing area in the world. Uh, it, it, would be, it, it would be first Russia and, and then and then Saudi Arabia, and then all the rest of the United States or, or the Permian, they'd both be at about six or seven million barrels a day. So, but in order to do that, you got to move 250,000 people into the area. Therein lies what Permian Strategic Partnership is about, which is what I'm about, which is, you know, safe roads, better housing, good schools, health care, all of that. But it had a front row seat to watching all of this and, and what, what it's meant for First, the economy, I'll go back to Energy Future Holdings real quick. At the time that I became chairman, it, it was $7. It went to $8. It all looked good for about a year. And then all of a sudden, that gas from the Haynesville and the Marcellus started coming in the market, and the guys, gas price went down and down and down. They went through a bankruptcy that got concluded in mid-2018. They, they bought it for $48 billion. And... Uh, and you know the assets when they went through bankruptcy were were somewhere between 20, 25 and 30 billion dollars uh, you know and, and i've watched what, what, what happened on oil price side oil price in, in the early part of the last decade decade was a hundred dollars and so the there were hundred dollars but saudi arabia the middle east saw all this production coming online they said we don't want to lose market share we we're going to see if we can bankrupt the oil and gas companies in the permian basin and so they opened up the valves the oil prices went from a hundred dollars to fifty dollars but guess what the technology w w was working so so well this the companies were doing so well that they just kept right on going and and so we've got a basin here in the permian basin that back in the late part of the last decade, 2008, the, the Permian Basin was expected to be delivering 500,000 barrels a day by now, the 2020. It's delivering 5 million barrels a day. And we're just getting started. I mean, we, we've got really 100 years of supply. So, so what's happened, you know, and the other thing I'd say real quick, Tom, would, would be the, the role that it's played and on the environmental side, which has just been fantastic. I, I don't, first, let, let me talk about the economy. Uh, economy, the, the price of oil went from, from 100 to $50. The price of gas went from eight to $2. That's like a $500 billion a year tax cut to the US economy, two trillion to the global economy. And the other thing you can say when you're thinking about the economy and how strong it is and how, and what the growth looks like is the economies, is often driven by consumer confidence. And consumer confidence is driven by the price of gasoline. The price of gasoline is low, everybody's confident, I got more money, I'm gonna spend some more money. If the price is high, then they're not so confident. So, you know, you think about uh, the, the decline in the price of both oil and gas and what it meant for the economy coming out of a tough recession in 2008 uh, I, I think it's it just uh, played a major role in, in the economic activity we've had for the past three or four years. The last point I make, it may be the most important point, which, which what has happened environmentally and, and what that has meant by bringing more gas on. I saw it up close and personal in the company that I was chairman of. We, we had nine coal-fired power plants. We had two of the most efficient, well, most well-run nuclear plants in the world, uh, Comanche Peak one, one and two, still running strong today, uh, no, no CO2 emissions, obviously. But we had nine coal-fired power plants. Uh, when, when I left, that had been reduced to three, and they were getting ready to take another one offline. With all of those reductions in coal-fired power plants across America, or are now greenhouse emissions across this country, are back down to the levels they were in the late 80s. And so it's quite remarkable what we've done on emissions. We've got more, more to do. Uh, wind, solar, that all helps. Uh, continuing to drive uh, coal-fired power plants off, off the grid is, is helpful. 
but it's just, it, it's an incredible story and, and uh, it's a remarkable story and and for me having had a chance to be in government for a while and, and see kind of the geopolitical side of it and the world order side of it it, it makes it even a more powerful story that, that this country because of our ingenuity because of that description I, I delivered to Vladimir Putin in Crawford Texas and in, in November 2010 we create the environment for people to take risks, try new ideas, do something different, do, do, do something better. That's what happened. And we have changed this from a country of energy scarcity and uh, energy abundance. And now we need to take, take advantage of it. And when I say that, I mean lead the world uh, toward a cleaner, better electricity provided environment for the world. The one last thing I want to say, Tom, and I'm yeah. sorry, but I want just big points to make here to people. You know, when I first arrived in, in Washington, D.C., I walked across the street to the World Bank, and I sat down with Jim Wolfeson. And Jim was the president of the World Bank at the time. And Jim, nice to meet Don. Thank you for coming by. It's Mr. Secretary. Appreciate you being here. I want to tell you about the world. Oh, great. Okay. I'd love to hear about the world. Don, there's 6 billion people on the planet. And three billion of them live on less than a dollar a day. That stuck with me to this day. It's just, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable to, to think about the number of people that are out there in this world that have no electricity or trying to, you know, we, we, it's, uh, it, it's uh, or no electricity and that means no light. I mean, if you live, live in the darkness all the time, it's not a particularly great quality of life. So I think that's an area that, you know, America ought to find ways to lead. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to come back to that in a minute, but let, let me uh, switch the conversation a little bit uh, to the impact of uh, COVID-19 here. Uh, it has certainly had a dramatic impact on demand. You know, CO2 emissions have, are down. Uh, clearly, gasoline uh, consumption is down. Um, a lot of wildcatters have, uh, I suspect, have rather stretched uh, balance sheets or personal balance sheets. What's your sense of the, uh, the, the current and longer term impact of this whole uh, pandemic on the oil and gas industry in general, and particularly uh, what you've been so caught up in in West Texas and other uh, mm. major uh, oil plays around uh, in this in this country. What what's uh, how badly are, are these folks hurting, and uh, are we going to lose a lot of them along the way here? What's the outlook? Yeah, yeah. First time, just look. Uh, our hearts and prayers go out to the whole world. I mean, this pandemic that we're pandemic that that we're uh, experiencing at the moment is nothing like anybody on the planet has ever seen before, and there's no playbook for it. And it's, uh, we're struggling our way through it. You know, we get a little good news one day and maybe not so good the next, but, but uh, so West Texas, Permian Basin, oil and gas industry had that to deal with uh, just in their own personal lives. But then on top of that, they had an oil price that collapsed from, from $50 a barrel to only one day it traded at minus $36. Oh, and uh, it, it went ne negative. And, and so it creates an incredible amount of uncertainty uh, that uh, trying to figure out where this is all going, what does it mean, how much is demand gonna collapse uh, for a little, for a week, week or two, maybe it was down 30 million barrels a day. Now it looks like it's down eight to 10 million barrels a day. I think the next getting it back to the 100 million barrels a day plus slightly is gonna take a while, it, it feels like. Uh, the, the, um, the immediate pain is there. It's real. It, it's, it's uh, a lot of, lit, you know, tens of thousands of people being laid off. Uh, for the fir first time, you, you're seeing um, major oil companies take steps that, you know, that nobody would have thought imaginable that, that would ha happen within their organizations. It, it's, so it's, it's tough times. Uh, there is layoffs occurring. Uh, or early retirements or whatever you might want to call them just a, across the board. So, so, so the pain is out there, it's real, but it's all short term uh, for the industry. The industry will be back, it will be back stronger, probably, uh, you know, uh, le leaner at some 
ways, one, one will say, but I was here in the, in the collapse of 85, 86. That, and that's when Saudi Arabia finally gave up trying to protect the price of oil that they drove it from three to 30 and then it started drifting down and they kept trying to protect it back in the early part of the eighties. But in the 86, they, they gave up, they threw in the towel, the price collapse and the industry collapse. It was been different back then because interest rates were 10, 11, 12 dollars. Inflation was still high. Uh, but, you know, banks went down, real estate went down, oil and gas, you know, companies folded, uh, but they came back quick. And that's the nature of America. I mean, you get knocked down, you get back up on your feet and go back at it because the human capital, the ingenuity, it, it's all still there. And so you, you that kind of that kind of culture, that kind of work ethic uh, means you get back on your feet in a hurry. And I, and, and this industry will get back on its feet in a hurry, it already is. We're starting to see signs of it, Not, nothing big. Uh, I mean, I gotta tell you that, that the rig count is at an historic low, uh, the lo lowest it's been since 1940. Uh, and, and to show you the kind of the swings in the early part of the 80s, there, there were almost 5,000 rigs run, running in America, 5,000. Now we have 150. Uh, but we, we can do more with four or 500 than now than, than we could do with 5,000, you know, 35 or 40 years ago. So Tom, it, we're uh, re re resilient. Uh, and, 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 and the thing I see really is, look, it's painful, it's no fun, but tremendous op optimism for what this industry can do for this country and for this world in the years ahead. And, and just a great feeling of how uh, it is to be in, the, in, in, our, in our driver's seat, so to speak, that we control our destiny in terms of oil and gas. Um, we've proven that in, in the last 10 years, that the reserves are here. Uh, and, and like I mentioned earlier in my comments, I mean, we're, we're sitting here in, in the Permian Basin, we're sitting on the largest secure supply of energy in the world amazing feeling to have. So th there's a lot of belief and hope and promise for the future. Uh, we, we call it out here the per Permian promise. Uh, and there's not anybody out here that really understands the science technology of it all that, that believes we're, we're not going to be back as strong as we were before. More as an industry than looking at the individual companies. You've got to assume that with the leverage uh, balance sheets of a lot of these uh, wildcatters or small oil and gas companies. Uh, hard, hard to believe that a number of those won't fall by the wayside here. So what we're really talking about is more the entrepreneurial uh, and imaginative spirit of people in the oil and gas business starting new companies as opposed to a number of these small, highly leveraged uh, uh, companies being able to, to uh, turn turn their balance sheets around and uh, survive in the business. No, Tom, that brings bring back an old personal story of mine. And when, when I first started in the business, President Bush and I had moved out here in the mid seventies. And uh, at the age of thir 33, I was president of a public oil and gas company that had a larger market cap than Ford Motor Company, which is pretty hard to believe. Uh, but when the downturn started and oil prices started to road, that all started to change and the economic forces just got too powerful. Now, the, the company that I was president of, Tom Brown was the name of it, uh, survived. We made it all the way through and paid everybody off, all the banks and everybody else. It wasn't any fun. But I tell you, I mean, I certainly learned my lesson about the risk of the industry. There are a lot of risk in this industry. One of the big ones is commodity, of course. And you shouldn't pile a bunch of financial risk on top of it. Exactly. So some of the young people who haven't been through the experience that I have, uh, they put too much debt on their companies. I would tell you since, <laughs> since that time for me, I haven't borrowed a dime. I, I quit borrowing any money. And because I knew there's just lots of risk in, in, in the industry, but you're right. I mean, it, it, it's ha happening now that a lot of them are failing. Well, if not failing, they failed back there, the banks. I mean, the big banks failed back, Continental Bank, Illinois, First right. Bank of I mean, all the Texas banks, they all failed. And that was because interest rates were out of sight and they just couldn't make the loan 
portfolio just got got clobbered. So anyway, good point though, Tom. Well, I, uh, I, I want to, we want to get you to talk a little bit more about what's going on from an environmental standpoint. But I know a couple of our students uh, who are going to ask some questions uh, have uh, want to press in that area. So I think what uh, what I suggest we do now is let me turn things back over uh, to Arun and he can introduce uh, our two graduate student questioners and then we're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. But uh, a lot of fun doing this with you and uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, I appreciate you, you very much to do this. Arun, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Um, let me just remind the audience that if you um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to put that in the Q and A box, um, and and we will uh, you know package your questions, look for patterns, and ask Secretary Evans. Uh, so the next section is on the student section. So let me introduce you to Stanford students, Kemp Gregory and Jordan uh, Conger. Kemp received his uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering at UT Austin, same as uh, Secretary Evans. And he received that in 2012 and then worked for, uh, worked for Shell for five years before joining Stanford for his master's in civil engineering. He is currently a co-founder of Renew Well, which uses oil wells for energy storage and brands itself by saying, oil wells that ends well. Um, Jordan is a MBA student at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he's currently an intern in Rubicon that uses software for smart waste and recycling. So over to you, Kemp and Jordan. Thank you, Arun. Uh, and first, I'd like to thank uh, Secretary Evans for joining us and for sharing your insight on the current state of the world and energy markets. Um, and then we, def we all appreciate your time and, and uh, perspective. I'll start with a couple questions and then pass it to Kemp. Uh, my first question, uh, oil and other fossil fuel companies have been characterized or are uh, or are seen as the enemy among many in the environmental community, which could prevent us from finding collaborative so solutions rather than simply punitive. Uh, on the other hand, oil companies with their immense capital resources, infrastructure, and expertise uh, possess the capabilities to potentially be a major part of the solution if they had the desire to do so. What role, if any, do you think traditional energy companies should play in the transition to new clean energy sources? Well, uh, good question, uh, Jordan. Uh, they should play a major role in it, and, and they already are playing a major role in it. I mean, some of it just marked by, as you find more resources like, you know, natural gas that allows us to use natural gas to substitute for coal, and, and that's certainly working well here in America. We need more to do uh, uh, continue to knock more of the coal fired plants off the grid that will be helpful so in that sense i mean they're already doing a lot but on the technical side they need to uh you know get innovative in in carbon sequestration and and uh co2 fl flooding that they, they can do and and co2 just keep capturing i've seen some big problems they're funded by oil and gas companies. Just say, hey, how do we ca capture it out of th thin air? CO2. So, so they they have a major major role to play. I, I think you know the in the beginning of your comments about you know ha how the industry is viewed. I think that's what that we need to change. Um, you know, I, I'm one that that uh, for, first of all, one, one thing. Uh, traveling the world and working in government. I mean, I, I, I've seen the world and I've seen the, the energy poverty that is in the world and the people that are living in the dark. And, and uh, I, I just think that America has got a role to play in, in uh, getting electricity to those parts of the world. And you got to work with, with the other countries and you got to work with others. But but the idea that we're the, the enemy, let, let me tell you, I'm, I'm a guy that, that uh, would tell you I love wind and I love solar. 
Um, Sue Solder, I think, has got a lot of promise. Not that it doesn't have some environmental issues. And they both have a whole lot of environmental issues. I mean, when in particular, I mean, the amount of land that it, it takes up, it, it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of land. Uh, and so it's got its, so even though I love, you know, those renewables, I'm also uh, pro mathematics and pro arithmetic and can add and, and see the number of people in this world that are living without electricity. And, and, you know, looking at the forecast of people that are, you know, do this for a living and study the, the global energy demands that we're gonna face for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And the idea that, that fossil fuels is going, going away is, you know, I, I met Jim Hansen, got, you know, I got to didn't know him well, but G Jim Hansen, you may or may not know him, but he's a world famous climatologist. And he was the one that was uh, one of those that presented the IPCC report to me in 2001. And he, he was talking about um, global warming and, and the challenges of it and the threat of it to our uh, economy not only here in the U.S., but, but a wor at the world. But, you know, Hanson himself said not too ma many years ago that, uh, you know, believing that, that renewables are going to replace fossil fuels in this world any time in, in the you know, future is like believing in the fairy, in the tooth fairy or, or the Easter bunny. I mean, you look at the math and it just, it just doesn't add up. And uh, look, of innovative things that are coming that could maybe helpful but you know you got to look at them carefully it, they, it, this was a complex world that we're in complex problems we, we've got complex energy problems water problems food problems terrorism and war problems environmental problems of you know air, land and sea uh, poverty problems which uh, we all ought to care about and we all do care about in, in a big way. And so there's a lot of big, big, big issues to, 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 to work on together and, and in a thoughtful, respectful way. And, um, you know, to characterize the oil and gas industry as an enemy, I just is somebody that doesn't understand the full picture. And, um, so, I, you know, that, that's kind of my thoughts on it that yes, you should the industry do a lot? Absolutely should do a lot. Uh, is it doing a lot? Yeah, it, it is doing a lot right, right now. Um, I, I, I can tell you that, that you know, what natural gas has done to improve the quality of, of the environment, this air environment here in, in the U.S. Is, is remarkable already. But, you know, the atmosphere, we got one atmosphere. That, that, that's, that's what we have. And, and the real problem that has to be attacked, and we've got to do it collectively and together, is, is uh, Southeast Asia and China. I mean, the numbers there are staggering. Uh, and and they're, they're not shutting down coal-fired power plants. They're building them. They're adding to them. I mean, Ch China, thankfully, is building 50 or, you know, on the way to finishing up 50 nuclear power plants. That helps. But, you know, and if you really, you know, uh, want a, a low carbon footprint is nuclear is where you find a low car carbon footprint. I mean, first of all, no CO2. And second of all, the land footprint is, is very small. Uh, but those are the kind of things you have to think about. And, and you know, wind, for instance, you know, which uh, just made me think about these renewables a little bit. The, the, the wind, wind power takes 10 times the, the land that solar does in terms of just space that, that it's taking up. So, you know, there are land issues and hey, how do we, you know, go after any problem? Well, you take the low hanging fruit first. Okay, well, when that's what they're doing. And that's, that's why they came to West Texas. We got a lot of land and we, got, we have wind. There are a lot of places in, in the country, the world, they don't want wind windmills. And, a lot of places in the world that it hadn't worked out too well for them. So these are all very, very complicated problems that we need to all come together on. And, and, and I, I can assure you that, that the industry has got its heart in the right place in terms of, look, we're trying to do what's in the best interest of, of um, 
our shareholders, of course, and our owners, but for mankind. I mean, I think this is an opportunity for America to lead, not just with its hard power, but with soft power. Thank you for that. I, uh, I appreciate the answer and the, uh, your comments about China actually connect to my second question was, you have discussed at various points today how oil has played a central role in shaping the global political landscape for at least the, the past 40 or 50 years. How do you think the transition from oil to renewable sources will impact global power dynamics and foreign policy, particularly as it relates to uh, our relationship with China? Well, that's another great question. And, and on the China front, as I see the um, kind of dialogue between the two countries today, uh, I consider myself somewhat of a failure for my efforts. I mean, when I went to China in the early part of the last decade, I went over there and developed some, you know, good friendships and getting to know the premiers and presidents and what what have you. And you know, said, look, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what's worked in, in America and and try to establish a relationship, a trust with the leadership over there, which I think I did while I was there. I think it was primarily because. I went west before I came back to the east after I said, look, I'm concerned about your uh, poverty problems in, that you have in this country and your energy pro poverty problems that you have in, in this country. And, and so that earned me some, you know, good marks. And I stayed close to some of them through the years that I got to visit with Xi Jinping some in the late part of the last decade, early part of this decade. But the relationship's changing. And, you know, I, if you would ask me that question, Gordon, just a couple, three years ago, I said, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could start exporting more of our natural gas to China and, and help them get more of their coal power, power plants off of the grid, which we, we've got the gas now. Uh, we want to help them get the coal power off the, the grid in order to help out of the global atmosphere. The other thing that would help would, would be uh, give China a little le leverage against Russia. Back to my comments earlier in talking about geopolitics, remember that when I was in office, it was Russia that was concerned about a 12 time zone border and worried about China coming over and, you know, weren't sure they wanted their pipeline to be anywhere close to the border. And that's all changed in the last few years, it appears. It appears now that uh, in fact, I was reading the paper this morning and that China and, and Russia are working together on a vaccine. Uh, China is getting their natural gas from Russia. Uh, so I don't know. I just don't know how it's going to play now. I mean, I, I think that uh, though China and India and Vietnam and Southeast Asia, those are the places that I, I wish we could take this global leadership that we didn't have you know, I'm going to tell you five or six years ago with respect to uh, our energy position, uh, which now allows us to go sit down across the table from a Vladimir Putin or the minister of any country in the world that we were importing from uh, with, with a different perspective. Uh, with the way we talk to leaders all over the world now is different. And so... You know, I don't know how it's going to play out with China. I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm disappointed that it's, that our relationships are deteriorating so fast, it seems to be. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm not reading it right, but that's certainly what the headlines seem to suggest. But if there's a way for us to help reduce their, uh, their electricity generation on, on coal, I'm, I'm all in. And I, look, I, I'm going give, to give them credit for building nuclear power, power, power plants. When, when I was uh, chairman of Energy Future Holdings, back in the early part of the last decade, I worked with Hank Paulson, and we had a, a strategic economic dialogue with China. And that was going on, I think it was years 2000, maybe 10 and 11. Uh, I, I'm not sure the exact time of it. But anyway, we, we had a a uh, relationship with Wandian Power, 
and we, one of the big power companies in China. And they would come to the U.S., they would come to Dallas, and we would talk about best practices. And I would go to China and sit down with them and talk about best practices there. Uh, one of the best practices that I liked they were doing is they were building six nuclear power plants side by side by side by side. Uh, and so, um, you know, and what, so I, I was hopeful that through all of that nuclear power plants they were building, they would figure out ways to big, bring costs down because that's something that Sam Biden and I really worked hard on. We, we, hard, we tried hard to get the country, U U.S., to move back toward nuclear power. And one of the reasons we did is we worked so hard on it because we saw the country was getting ready to run out of natural gas. And uh, we were dead right. You know, there would have been, been, been another classic example of us having to import gas to run our, our, our power plants. We so said, we need to have nuclear power in the mix. Uh, we were unsuccessful in that. And, um, but fortunately for, for America, we found this uh, amazing amount of gas resources now that can fund gas fired plants. But that, that's the one thing China's doing to help themselves. And there are lots of windmills, solar farms, all that. But it's still way too many coal power, power plants. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, we're going to have one more question for me, and then we'll move on to the open Q&A session. Um, we've talked about a lot of things, um, covered a lot of ground, honestly knocked out a lot of questions before we had a chance to ask them, which is great. Um, but I want to turn uh, the conversation about coal into um, Africa and other developing nations. Um, for those part of the world, for those parts of the world that have recently industrialized or expected to do so in coming decades, how might they leapfrog over coal as the main energy provider? And could doing so help alleviate energy poverty in places like Africa and India? Now, great, great questions. And it's why I said what I did earlier. I mean, we got to work together on this. We ought to have a look. Let's all decide collectively that energy poverty is a big problem in this world. And let's decide collectively that the United States of America needs to lead the world. We particularly need to lead the world on, on these types of issues, in my judgment. I mean, similar to what President Bush did while he was in office with PEPFAR, with taking this country and saying, we've, we've got a, an AIDS issue and, and in Africa that needs to be dealt with. And America, we need to step up and go deal with it and go help them. And, and we did, and we got behind it and would save uh, tens of millions of lives because of that. It needs to be that same kind of spirit and that same kind of leadership coming out of our government. Quite That's the only place it can come from. And we've got to say that, uh, that you know, we do care about you. Uh, we, we don't want you to have to li live your life in the dark and not have a ch chance of education. I'll tell you one qu quick story about that. And uh, I, I went, you know, I'm, I'm from West Texas and spent most of my life here. Uh, I spent just about all my life in, in Texas. So when, when I became Secretary of Commerce, it was really my first time to really tr travel much around the world. Uh, and I always looked at America as a compassionate nation, a compassionate country. Look, I, I understand all the foreign aid that we give the countries here and beyond. But I went to Morocco and, uh, and I, I, I gave a, some, some remarks. And, and based on my comments I got from Jim Wolfeson back when I first arrived in office, you know, I, I would often include in my remarks wherever I was. First, I always, wherever I went in the world, I always made sure I went to an area where people were hurting, they were hungry, they were living in the dark. They, they, they needed a help, they needed a helping hand. And I wanted to at least be representative of that. But anyway, I'm talking to a group in Morocco and it was, a, it was a big crowd. It was at night and I'm giving my remarks and I, I said, you know, as I look at the world, there, there's six billion people on the planet and three billion of them lived on less than a dollar a day. There, there, there's too, too much poverty, not enough hope there there's too much despair not enough opportunity in too many parts of the world and it's our responsibility to do something about it and i believe that i still believe it. so that's the kind of attitude though i think you need to have as a leader of this nation 
to which is the strongest, most powerful nation in the world. We've talked about it earlier. I think we consume more, consume more electricity than anybody in the world. Uh, interesting. I'll, I'll tell you about that real quick. We don't really change. China's first and then us. Just to give you a touch of feel of the problems that are coming with respect to energy, it is China, US, and then the tech sector. That's third in the world now in terms of consuming electricity. And that's gonna do not anything but grow. So the, so the challenges are really big. And so you gotta have le leadership that takes the mantle of America's leadership and say, we got energy poverty in the world, and we got one billion people that are living in the, in the dark. Now, how as a world are we going to come together and, and, and help? And uh, you know, there there's a couple of great uh, movies on that that are out there. Anybody that my uh, good friend Scott Tinker down, down at Bureau of Economic Geology, he's got a m movie called uh, Switch, Switch On, which is a great movie that. that and then Robert Bryce has got uh, a movie out there also that uh, focus on the challenges of electricity and uh, delivering electricity to places like Africa and India. So, you know, people that are really interested in this topic ought to go to Robert Bryce's, you know, website and, and Scott Tinker's website because they've done some wonderful work on this that really do give you a full feel of the challenge of the problem. That, that, you know, we can't sit here and say, the oil and gas guys are bad, and we gotta have a bunch of windmills and solar, and we're gonna solve this problem in the next 15 years. That's just, that's believing in the tooth fairy. And, and that doesn't help any, anything. So I just, I, I hope the country kind of can get educated to help big the problem is and, and how uh, how important it is for, for us to do something about it. Well, thank you, uh, Jordan and Kemp. Uh, that was a student section and we have a few minutes left for the audience. And um, Secretary Evans, thank you for all your comments. I'm gonna package some of the um, things that we are hearing from the audience into the first question and then Sally and I will go back and forth and we'll do a tag team with you. Mm -hmm. um, the, let me take the first sentiment, so to speak, and talk about US leadership in climate. Um, we, we all acknowledge that there's a climate uh, problem, the CO2 emissions. If you look at the numbers that the scientists are suggesting, if you are to keep our temperatures below two degrees, a global average temperature rise, which is the Paris Agreement, um, we have about 20 to 30 years left and we have to do something about it. And the question is, yes, we can do something internationally, but you gotta get our uh, house in order first. And um, so the question is, what do we do? And in terms of policy, and here you mentioned Secretary Schultz, Secretary Schultz and Secretary Baker has suggested a revenue neutral carbon tax. Tom has been a big advocate for that. My question to you is, okay, so how do we, how do we, how do we get a revenue loop? First of all, do you agree with that? Secondly, how do we get that achieved in Washington, D.C.? And then how do we use that as a lever to lead in the world? Uh, let, let, let me say that I, I think it's a, uh, a, a certainly a, a wise uh, concept. Uh, you know, let, let me start here. You know, the, the best way, one of the best ways to deliver conservation of something is to charge more for it, to put a higher price on it. So, so that thought, uh, I'm for conservation. Uh, and we do try a lot with technology and we're doing and we're doing some good, but, but really, if you want to do something with it, charge more for it. And so putting the carbon tax on, uh, it, I think has got some merit. Now you got to think about it a little bit in, in this sense that if, if you put a tax on it, it's going to cost more here. So what's the product? 
Is it a product that can be made in China or is it a product that can be made in India? And if it's a product that can be made in China and India and they can make it cheaper because they don't have to deal with the tax, are they making that fruit product in a country that is uh, emitting a lot more CO2 than we are? I mean, that's just something that I would have to think through. But I, I've, I've said for 20 years, and I said it when, when, when I was up there, that I like the idea of a tax because I thought conservation was important. And I thought that uh, if you charge more for it, people will use less up for it. And then you have to be careful, though, what you do with the money. You, you, you got to be ca careful that the money is going where it should go. I mean, I don't tell you, I can't tell you I got the answer to that, but that's always kind of the problem is, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this and we're going to generate some re revenue for the government. Now, what, what are they going to do with it? And maybe it's to solve the social security problem or a Medicare problem. I don't know, but anyway, but I think it's a good idea uh, to th think about, can we achieve it? I don't know. Uh, I'm not that close to it, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, you got some great uh, minds on it uh, with George Schultz, James B Baker, and I know others have joined uh, that, that group. Uh, it's not a, you know, it, it's been kicked around up there for a while. And uh, it's just, you know, I, I, I went through the cap and trade but big battles. And when it comes to energy, uh, there's just, you know, enough senators out there, enough congressmen out there to, you know, maybe a good, good idea, but you know, they can figure out ways to block it. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not the wizard on t telling you how to use it, but, but your last point of, you know, uh, we got to figure out something. And, and if that's it, I'm all for it because we got to figure out something for, for China and I India to, to get serious. And, and that may be it, and that may be it. I mean, it may, maybe it's gotta got have, look, uh, we're gonna do it, but we're gonna show China and India that they've gotta do the same thing or something similar to it. Uh, because we, we got a way, we, we got to lead. We got to figure out a way to lead the world because the big, big problems, uh, yeah, we got problems here in the US and the 2% two, two uh, the, the two degree growth is, is an issue. And, and there, there will be things that, that Congress will do that will try to, you know, make us, you know, more efficient here and, and use less fuel and, and, and hopefully that they're helpful in, in attacking that problem. But, but the other problems of the world are, are still out there and they're still massive. And so um, we, we got to, what I really admire and I've always admired people like uh, George Schultz and James A. Baker for is just willing to step up and take a, a leadership role, and, and I'm, gl I'm glad they've done it on, on this one, because we got to figure out a way to bring the, the other countries along. Um, we, we, you know, you mentioned the Accord. America is the only one, I was told this last week, we're, we're the only one that has met our cap on the utility side. Nobody's done it on the transportation side but we're the only ones that have done it on the utility side. Uh, so we'll see. Um, Great. Thank you, thank you, Secretary Evans. Let me um, hand it over to Sally. For the next okay, question. well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, so question from the audience. Uh, so should U.S. industry be concerned about the EU's border tax, uh, border carbon tax imposing a levy on U.S. products if the U.S. does not expedite its decarbonization? No, oh, I don't know if they ought to be concerned about it. It, it sounds like trade policy uh, take, taking over and it, it's hard to answer that um, without being involved in, in all the discussions. I mean, certainly if you're making a, a, a product, uh, you want to be able to, uh, you, you don't want to have tariffs slapped on it if you're moving it to, to another country. So would it cause them some concern? I'm sure it does at some level, but I'm just not a, I'm not close enough to that market right now to help you a whole lot. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean it's a program. I tell you what, what I saw when I was in government, 
uh, we'd slap a tariff on, on, on a country and we'd sh sh shut off that product coming in from that country, but they would ship it to some other country and that country would do a little something to it and then ship it into America without a tariff. So, you know, there's all kinds of games that get played out there and uh, that particular one, Sally, I can't help you that much with. I, I was always a free market guy and, you know, uh, avoid t tariffs at all costs. And, but sometimes you just are not able to. I mean, the, the laws are on the books and you have to enforce the laws. And that's certainly what I ran into. I, I had to slap some tariffs on some products that I didn't want to slap on there, but the laws were on the books and we went through the process. And, and those that wanted the tariffs on, they, they won. Okay, thank you. Well, back to Arun. Sure. Um, so let me ask the question on on the electricity grid. Um, we are facing as COVID nineteen has shown the value of the electricity grid is um, is quite significant, and yet, at least in the United States, there's a lot of upgrading that is needed, um, especially with the weather extremes that we're going to likely the heat waves, the grid grid will be stressed, and you know, with the oil and gas kind of down right now, the electricity, the value of electricity is going up. And we heard a few weeks back from Chad Holliday, the chairman of Shell, um, looking at the electrical power sector as something quite favorably for an oil and gas company. So my question to you is, should the oil and gas sector as a broader energy entity be looking at the electricity sector for investments, for acquisitions, for kind of uh, as a business strategy in the future? Well, it's, it's uh, the big, big biggest industry in the world. I don't think there's anything more important in as an industry uh, than electricity in, in the world. It connects us all uh, around the world. Uh, the electric industry in the United States of America is, is pretty complicated. Uh, we got all kinds of different regions that have rules in place and we've got states that are deregulated and they're unregulated uh, in other parts of, of business. Uh, you know, look, I, I think that uh, if uh, I'm not aware of any big major companies that are looking to electricity right now, but uh, if, if there is an opportunity for them to go in and, and bring some of the expertise that they've learned from from their energy side of the equation, that being the oil and gas, uh, so be it. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I, I would say, you know, this, you, you know, one thing th that I did learn in when I was the chairman of the EFH is I, I, I do think, you know, I, I like a, uh, there, there needs to be some regulations around it uh, because it's just, it's just a too important commodity uh, to get delivered to homes to not have some regulations around it, quite frankly. Uh, and so I, I, I think it, as a utility, I think there is some kind of government involvement uh, that, that's required. And I know, I mean, it, look, let, 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 let me tell you the big thing about electricity in the world and back to Africa and India and those areas. The, the thing you got to have is you've got to have integrity in the system. And so if there are, if there are oil and gas companies that can, can take control of electric power delivery in places of the world where they can bring integrity to it, then that's a huge winner. But when you go into the world and you look into uh, what we call energy poverty, which means they don't have any electricity, and what electricity they do have you find out there's tremendous corruption. And, uh, and, and that's a big challenge I mean, when, when you go into Africa or any other part, part, part of the world that, that is struggling with, with, with electricity. But, uh, you know, I, look, I, I think energy is energy, energy's energy and, and having a broad understanding of it is a smart thing. And I think having a, a, you know, a, a broad investment in it can be a, a smart thing. Certainly in, in terms of climate change, energy's gonna be one of the keys because it's, it's 
uh, electricity is going to be one, one of the keys because how, how do you generate electricity? And, uh, and pe people are thinking we're going to be drilling, doing a lot of it with solar and wind. I, yeah, I think we will, but we're also going to be doing a whole lot with it of coal and, and, and natural gas, and I hope we a lot more nuclear. Sally, over to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question from the audience. Um, if the U.S. has 100 years of natural gas reserves, should we perhaps take a longer term perspective and try to make it last a thousand years instead? Again, I'm not sure I'm going to worry about that one a whole lot, but anyway, uh, look, I, I've seen that happen in my career uh, from time to time. Canada, for instance, back in the 80s, um, all of a sudden it looked like their reserve life was down to, you know, eight or nine years and Canada started passing policy legislation up there. Uh, they would not export into the U S because they wanted to protect the reserves for their own country. And that lasted a while. I'm not sure when it was taken off because they certainly do export a lot in the U S now, but, uh, you know, a thousand years, that's looking out there a little farther than I'm capable of looking. I'm, I mean, look, I, I, the energy industry is in tr transition. It always has been, it always will be. We're going through one now, uh, and we're, we're gonna have some more major transitions to work our way through in the next 40 or 50 years, and then maybe the next 80 or 90 years, a, a thousand years. I'm, I'm, I'm just not too worried about it. Well, thank you for that. And uh, Arun, back to you. Yeah. Thanks. There's another, uh, Secretary Evan, there's another question from the audience on electric vehicles. Um, just to give you a little context, the battery cost has come down by, you know, a factor of five over the last 10 years. In the next couple of years, it is anticipated that the battery cost will be down to the point that electric vehicles will be cost and range competitive co compared to gasoline cars. And you give it another 20 years, um, you know, you'll, it'll get cheaper and it'll get better. And we are now seeing the car companies um, like GM and the big three saying that they'll be electric companies. The biggest car company right now is Tesla. Uh, the stock price has gone up, you know, just dramatically <laughs> over the last, you know, just during the COVID-19. So given all of that, this is a tectonic shift in the transportation sector. The question is the implication on oil. And do you expect to see a peak oil demand, peak demand in oil? And if so, when do you think it's going to happen? And what are the implications of the oil industry? Yeah, let, let me touch both of those, Aaron, if you don't mind. First of all, uh, electric cars, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. I'm delighted that we're making headway there. And I'm delighted we're making headway on the batteries. And I also think that we'll continue to make ever more headway. However, at, at the moment, when I look at cars, electric cars, I hear some people say we're going to have half the cars in the world by 2040 are going to be electric. Uh, that would be uh, 600 million cars. There's 1.2 billion now. In cars today, and I realize this is going to get better, but in cars today, there's 5,000 batteries. So, 600 million cars, 5,000 batteries it was today, that'd be 3 trillion batteries. And so when I start thinking about the batteries and the making of the batteries and the lithium and all the rare earth minerals that go into making uh, these exotic cars and batteries and the like, I think China's an interesting observation as they are going around the world getting control of more and more and more of the rare earth minerals. I had somebody show me uh, about oh, six months ago, they were showing me the expected uh, growth in lithium in the world. And what does US have? Right now, not much. Not much. There's a little bit we're aware of. There's, there's some in Canada. There's a little bit aware of, but most of it's not in the US. But there's lots of other rare earth minerals that, that go into a lot of these exotic new types of energy that we're driving and especially in batteries. So we'll have to 
see that. The answer to your question, yes, I, I believe in peak demand of oil. Uh, I believe that it's at least uh, 20 years out there. Uh, as I look at a lot of the research data that uh, people continue to grind away on and look at a growing global economy and look at it going from 7 billion people to 9 billion people and, and try and factor all of that in uh, and, and bring on as much wind and solar as we can, as fast as we can, and as fast as countries will allow it and neighborhoods will allow it, and, you know, I think that we're going to see big growth in energy demand between now and 2040. And, and I think that the gas and oil demand will, will be still about the same as it is today. I, you know, what I've seen that feels kind of good to me is getting oil demand up to 110 or 115 million barrels a day and flattening it out there. And then, and then who, who knows what 20 or 30 years from now, but all of the, you know, all, you know, serious people that are looking at this is and trying to forecast this really rapid growth of global uh, solar and wind and other renewables and not getting nuclear into the mix, which I think is a big, a big mistake. Uh, I, I just think we're going to need the gas and, and the oil for at least out to 20 years, but it will, it will flatten out. And Aaron, look, I, I'm, I would say to you this, I, I think uh, ingenuity and the like, it, you know, oil demand is, is probably going to peak, you know, may, maybe so sooner than, than a lot of people think. Thank you. We'll have one more question from Sally, and then we'll bring this uh, dialogue to a close, if you want. Okay, well, thank you. So, so you rightly point out that um, the availability of low-cost natural gas has had a major impact on the reduction of power generation from coal and the consequences for um, CO2 emissions have been really significant. Uh, in fact, the US peaked uh, total emissions in 2007. And, and as, you noticed, as you noted, you know, we're down to levels uh, you know, in, in the late 80s. Um, however, there's a big concern about methane emissions, uh, fugitive emissions from methane. And, and the specific question from the audience is that, what do you think about the uh, rollback on, on methane emissions? And you know, what should we be doing about this important issue that uh, can, can um, you know, take away some of the benefits that, that natural- Yeah, no, we need to get control of it. We, we, we shouldn't ha have the emissions. Uh, they need to figure it out. Um, it, it's a tough problem. I don't want to be flipping about it. I, it, it it's not a, Problem. What it is, it's an issue at some level, but having said that, I think we need to get control of it. I'm, I'm one that we ought to be working as aggressively as we know how to eliminate um, methane emissions. And I'm, I'm just against it. So um, again, I'm not in the industry right now, so I'm not that, that, that close to it, but, but I'm, 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 I'm close enough to it to know that you know, we got to work really hard on eliminating it, reducing it dramatically. I'm close enough to it to tell you that that, that thinking is uh, being pursued. That that policy, that attitude is actively being pursued. I, I think we'll we'll see methane emissions come down uh, rather dramatically. Have been coming down already. Of course, have come down a lot. COVID-19. Uh, but I, I think you'll see them come down dramatically in the months and years ahead. Important goal for, for the industry to have, no question about it. Okay, well, thank you, and I'll bring back to you. Great. Uh, Secretary Evans, thank you so much for joining us today. And as a former employee of Department of Energy, thank you so much for mentioning Secretary Bodman, who was in a very influential in, in, in the whole energy enterprise. And, and Tom, thank you for making all of this happen. And thanks to Jordan and Kemp for joining us today. And to all of you joining us from around the world, we hope you found today's Global Energy Dialogue informative and relevant during these unprecedented times. Please join us two weeks from now for a conversation with two exceptional individuals who are leading two most exciting clean energy companies based in China and India. Lei Zhang is the founder and CEO of Envision uh, Group. And Suman Sinha is the chairman and managing director of Renew Power uh, in India. 
and we will discuss the impact of China and India on the global energy transition. Again, please register on our website, gef.stanford.edu, and note the date and time, September 1st, 7.30 to 9 a.m. California time, not 8.30 to 10, 7.30 to 9 a.m. California time. We will now conclude our broadcast of today's program. On behalf of the entire Stanford Precode Institute for Energy, we thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.